Good afternoon and welcome to our today's panel discussion. My name is Shokat Ali Khan and I'm the Chief Information Officer here at the University of Central Asia. Our today's discussion topic is Artificial Intelligence in Civil Service. And the panel discussion is being organized in collaboration with Strategy East and University of Central Asia. In our today's panel discussion, we will learn from the experts if artificial intelligence can help improve the relationship between citizens and the government. We will also learn if the government will be able to replace some civil service position with artificial intelligence in the near future, and also how will artificial intelligence change healthcare, security, and policymaking. As we all know that these issues have been discussed in the West for a long time, and it's time to discuss them in relation to the countries of Eurasia today. I'm really happy that we have a solid panel consists of international experts from Eurasian countries. Our today's panelists are Ole Hernik, Head of Data Architecture at EPAM Systems Ukraine, Evgeny Koren, Country Manager at Microsoft Belarus, Andrea Shubertziro, General Director at EPAM Systems Belarus, and Peter Svetsini. Swetizen, Chief Executive Officer at Neron, Georgia. I would request Ole to tell us a little bit about himself and his perspective on artificial intelligence in civil service. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm Ole Hrenek and I'm data and analytics consultant uh, working on ML AI for the past seven years and also building data platforms. So today I want to give you my perspective on uh, why government and modern organization are similar. So they share um, like the same problems and same goals, uh, especially data analysis problems, which can be divided into expertise, technical, understanding of data, data quality, politics, process and organization and security. So nowadays it's very hard to be uh, successful without uh, knowing the data and understanding, the understanding of data. Uh, everyone wants to make like uh, data-driven decisions and apply automation. However, not many understand that there is like entire journey to make to get to this level when you can actually take advantage of AI and ML. Because going into M straight into AI and ML without proper preparation, uh, it will not be sustainable in the long run, right? So, and uh, right now ML and AI is very, like I would say, hot topic and everyone wants to use it. Uh, like many companies want to use it for PR, for example. We've seen this in the past. However, um, like there is like one misconception that ML and DI is very complex. In reality, it's not like the biggest problems related to the ML and DI are, uh, are actually getting the data and prepare the data for ML and DI. Because uh, right now, like you don't even need to care much, much about mass. Uh, and in some cases, you don't even need to do coding because there are like optimal frameworks available which can do that. And everyone just forget about that, that actually getting the data and preparing the data for ML is the hardest part. So to, to go to the ML, I would say you have to have like um, entire tool set up and running. Uh, Many can say that you can uh, make a shortcut here and there. However, um, like we are living in the changing world and uh, like as everyone understood that last year when COVID hit us uh, and it affected business uh, in every way. So I was doing like a lot of consulting last year and I've been working with various institutions and companies and all of them were focusing on getting something short term without like proper planning. They were growing too fast. They were building more ML and DI. And in the end, basically, uh, when COVID hit them, uh, all of their ML and DI 
um, like I would say, assets uh, became like irrelevant anymore because they were not like able to react and change. So because these companies and institutions were focusing on like getting this short-term goal, like all that they did like was not useful anymore. And they had to apply some uh, very hard decisions which were very expensive and rethink how they, so how they going to do. So I could speak about this topic. I mean, like how to get uh, and build like ML and DI for a while, but I have like only a couple of minutes. So I will focus on, I would say, a uh, couple most important problems. And first one, I guess, is the most hardest one is getting the data. And actually, when you start working with various companies and especially like uh, government institution, you will face all these kind of problems which you can face. So for example, one, uh, or one department don't want to give you the data or uh, there is like huge variety of the data and this uh, data provider don't want to change it for you. Or uh, you have to get the agreement to receive the data. And in case you're speaking about governments, is this problem is uh, arising more critical way, I would say, right? So, uh, so to make this, uh, there is like one component uh, which you have seen like beforehand is some sort of integration engine which will allow uh, data providers to, to send you the data because as I said, like there are like a lot of different aspects which you have to face, right? And why you need this integration engine is because a couple of reasons. First one is when you work with organizations like government, like they won't provide you access to the data and they would like to do that by, by themselves. So you have to build um, some sort of solution which is able to extract the data without like your, uh, I would say, work. And actually we are building this right now in our country. Uh, and the next one is, I would say, is a storage. So because we are working and living in the changing world, like data use cases are changing differently. And there are like many access patterns, yeah, which are batch, SQL, um, like batch extracts, like someone wants to access like a huge data sets, right? And want to run different kind of analytics. So your data storage should be flexible. Uh, and honestly speaking, like even now, like companies are not like, using best practices which are available. So they still are thinking like a short-term solution and uh, many are still like using database and doing all this kind of analytics on top of relational database, which is no longer like, a, I would say golden, uh, silver bullet. Uh, I was working last year when one company uh, wanted to do like all the sort of analytics on relational database and in the end it's faced a situation when they had to extract like a huge data set for ML, uh, which deemed to be too expensive later on because database was, wasn't able to handle that. Um, and basically they had to do like a wrong, uh, I would say not efficient decision just to use very expensive technology for that. So, what I want to say is that there is like a huge journey to get to the ML and we have to plan and see how it's working uh, to make it right, right? So we have to uh, properly plan it. We have to build like proper expertise and we have to use the best practices and not do like short-term decisions because in the end it will not uh, be uh, like sustainable. Uh, and also while we are working in, with government and citizen data, there is like a um, possibility to uh, so some fraud of the data. So access to the data also have to be secured and monitored. So uh, when somebody access citizen data, like this data also needs to be like uh, monitored who and why use it. Uh, so there are like plenty of aspects and plenty of problems for ML, uh, like 
for using ML and DI, and we have to properly plan it. Thank you. Thank you, Ole. Very, very interesting. Uh, we will come back on a on couple of more details uh, later on, uh, but I would like to ask Evgeny from the Microsoft uh, point of view, uh, what are your perspective on the artificial intelli intelligence in the, in the civil servants uh, field, in the, in the government field, actually? Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, uh, glad to see you all and welcome to the whole audience. Yeah, we have actually rich experience in Microsoft uh, regarding the today's topic. And uh, I would like to go quickly through the questions which were raised uh, because I have like tons of slides about different projects. Uh, I don't know, uh, realized um, solutions, etc. So it's, uh, it can be last for hours. But uh, answering the question, uh, for example, the first one, if government can replace uh, some of the civil servants with AI uh, in the nearest future, I could say that actually the future is here already and uh, they already doing it and replacing these uh, civil servants with artificial intelligence solutions. We have a lot of implementations of different solutions with chatbots uh, worldwide, uh, you can even see, you can talk to to bot and could not realize if you're talking actually to a bot or, or to a real person. It's already happening. And um, the question, I think the right question would be if government want to do that, because if you're replacing, let's say, a uh, big amount of uh, uh, servants uh, by artificial intelligence, you, you think you need to think about what to do with them after it, because they will lose their job. The recent example, for example, uh, from US is with uh, TurboTax. I don't know if you heard about it. In US, it's very popular when uh, tax accountant uh, filling taxes instead of you. This is kind of um, traditional service in US. And uh, tens or hundreds thousands of people, those accounts were, were replaced by the uh, this TurboTax solution already. And they just uh, lost their job and it was like, the full industry disappeared. And uh, we can think uh, next steps, uh, nearest future, which already we see uh, is realistic, is with replacing, for example, public transportation uh, drivers, right? So we, we see a lot of uh, autonomous driving vehicles which already can, can do that uh, without a driver. And in again, in US, it's more than 3 million uh, workers who are, who are doing just, who are working as a driver. So um, I think, uh, um, going back what Alec just raised, uh, um, we in Microsoft are following uh, the kind of a paradigm that uh, all our solutions and partner solution should follow uh, the policy of responsible AI. So uh, we strictly uh, follow the privacy and all other aspects and for sure this uh, very sensitive uh, job uh, um, ex, um, job delusion the job fact and etc so um, I think this is the things which we need to talk about right now I don't know I'm just um, not having the ready one presentation I'm brainstorming and give you ideas and I would like you know to have more maybe live discussion uh, it's more interesting from my perspective um, just uh, sure, uh, Giri, we will we will come uh, to that, and then um, uh, just to uh, also request all the all the participants uh, that uh, there is a chat box here, a question answer uh, box here. If you have any questions, uh, please just write there, and uh, all the all the participants who are listening on our social media, please just uh, put your questions on the uh, comment field, and then I will take uh, those questions and then ask uh, the experts. So I will, I will move forward to uh, Andrea as, as you are um, leading the technology company, IFM, which is which is a very famous and on emerging technologies also. How do you see, what is your perspective 
perspective uh, on uh, using AI in the in the uh, civil services in the government government sector. Hello. Uh, hello, colleagues. Um, I'm Andrew, and I I want to apologize in advance for my English. It is far from perfect. More than 30 years in the army, I knew only three words. I think today will be better, yes? And um, I begin with a small uh, true story from my life in Nepal. October 8, 2018, CEO Arkady Dobkin and I met with Prime Minister Rumas. Ark told him, Sergei Nikolaevich, I don't know uh, what I can tell you about us. Ipan Belarus has 10,000 employees, Rumas. How many people did you say? It was a premier of the IT country that we have been building for over 14 years years. Why am I talking about this? Uh, most people from the government do not want to know all the information about the people in their countries. They do not understand that people are the main asset. It is our oil, if I may say so. They do not understand that if you receive more and more information about people, you can solve many problems. The main one is what people want. I want to show uh, only three slides. Yes, we can see the slides. Yes. Uh, that will help us understand how personal data helps the economy and how the results uh, of this development depend on people. Um, actually, in May 2019, I showed Lukashenko to IPAM. The capitalization was about 10 billion. Today is more than 20 billion. The first slide, the path of our employees to IPAM. At each stage, we have data about him, which gives us a portrait of our specialist. This data and artificial, artificial intelligence help improve the predictions of our specialist behavior. We know, we know everything about him every minute, even if he is about to leave. We can transfer him to another project if he is tired or initiate his promotion. The second slide is a result of our work with employees. On this slide, you see our capitalization per one employee from 16 February 2016 to 16, uh, uh, 12 February, 2021. I think only our hard working with people give us this result. Uh, one of trends next year is sharing economy, where everything uh, will depend who, for who quicker and better will receive data and using AI. Uh, when I meet with various governmental officials, I tell them about IPAM and give them the main message. Please try to always know that people around you are doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, now I will uh, request uh, Peter to uh, uh, share his perspective on uh, the, the artificial intelligence in the government or, or civil services. What is your experience and what are, what are your thoughts in, in this area? Um, well, now we have some product, I think it's the uh, main. Oh, 
Andrea, it's uh, for Peter. Ah, Peter, sorry, sorry. Yes. No, thank you, thank you. I will um, come back to you. <clears throat> yeah, interesting, interesting, Andre. Thank you. Um, no, so I, um, I am Swedish and I live in Georgia since a long time. Uh, I will speak today mainly from a Georgian point of view, uh, try to uh, see which parallels and, and which uh, channels there are forward uh, making use of, of Georgia's uh, uh, approximation to, to the EU, which has uh, happened over the last years. Um, so Nairon, the, the artificial intelligence company that I'm running, um, is somehow harnessing the best, I, I hope, of, uh, of two uh, uh, different societies. So we, we take a lot uh, from uh, our Swedish founders, really, in terms of uh, human rights, in terms of uh, uh, civil uh, uh, law, uh, and other such considerations. But we've found in Georgia a very, very interesting sort of bubbling hub of, uh, of all the points that are strong here, which is uh, probably strengths uh, that you will find similar in, in Ukraine and Belarus, et cetera, et cetera, where um, the, the young guys are much stronger here in, in core at, uh, areas within AI, such as physics or mathematics, or even maybe to a little smaller extent, uh, uh, computer sciences. So we're hoping, hoping that these, uh, these two uh, different parts of the, of the spectrum uh, can help move the whole process of uh, AI development forward. Because what we're standing at the, at the moment is, uh, <laughs> it's a little bit alarming, you know. Uh, uh, there is now within EU, they have, they have started, uh, as Schaukart was saying, it's been discussions going on for, for some years, but it's going very slowly. But of course, there are these uh, uh, bodies that are now working on a, on a framework where the uh, GDPR is, is uh, important. But if you then look at Georgia, who is, uh, uh, you know, um, have signed an approximation agreement with EU in Georgia, if you look, there is nothing, you know, for the for the civil uh, civil society, there is no framework, uh, no laws. Uh, they don't even uh, talk about it. So you know, we have started to see now. Uh, Neron as a conduit for, for helping this process, which will be one of the most important uh, things to do and, and quickly. Um, and the first thing that needs to be taken off is the stigma. You know, people are afraid. I think all the three of you who spoke before me have been touching upon it. You know, you're always afraid of things that you don't understand. And, uh, you know, it, can be afraid of you know you've seen some science fiction movie seeing some supercomputer starting the third world war or uh, to come back to the concept note here you know people are afraid of losing their jobs right now uh, some of the previous i think yevgeny was was talking about okay so what do we do with them i think this is also a bit of a a dangerous uh, road to go down. I think, uh, you know, uh, I see societies and countries and of course companies always also um, following a business cycle, right? So, you know, you, you, you start, you grow, you develop, and then, but after, after a while it starts going down unless you can reinvent yourself, you know? So to, hesitate that there might be, you know, 100,000 bus drivers uh, uh, being redundant. It's, I, in my opinion, not the a, not a correct way to, to look at it, uh, because how you must see it is, of course, this, it's an extreme opportunity that we're having uh, with, the, with the development of, of all different uh, technologies where AI is only one, but, you know, when you as you know, when you mix it with other technologies, you can, 
you can create uh, wonders. So the question must uh, must be broader. I think it must be how do we how do we change uh, education educational system to to reflect what we think that the future is going to be, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, instead of being afraid that some positions will be taken over by by an AI in this case. Uh, because if we don't work to the fullest of our potential with the means that we have, means someone else will do it. I mean, that could be China or, or, or new, new companies or new states or, or, or whoever. So for me, it's not an option to, to slow down uh, invention and development only in order to protect something that then obviously is not uh, efficient. Um, <clears throat> there is actually in preparation of a, of this uh, little speech. I, I just I was reading something and I and I found strangely enough from a uh, from a quite a famous uh, uh, French philosopher that that lived already during the last century. But what he said already some forty years ago, uh, in my opinion, stands truer than ever. So this was uh, Jacques Ellul. He said that modern technology has become a total phenomenon for civilization. The defining force of a new social order in which efficiency is, is no longer an option, but a necessity imposed on all human activity. I think this is, uh, this is how we have to look at it, in my opinion. Uh, just to finish off, so the first steps that we're taking with Neyron to try to uh, move this forward is that first of all we have created something called Neuron Academy, where we are trying to uh, teach all aspects, but uh, uh, of of AI, but um, maybe extra much so in ethics regulations and the judiciary sector, uh, because this will be the basis also to take away the stigma that people can feel safe in the, in the framework environment that we're that we're building up i think maybe i am uh, talking too long so i i'll stop it there but uh, that's uh, that's just a, a, a brief overview of how we see it uh, georgia versus europe and georgia versus the future uh, thank you uh, peter i think it's it's very interesting and then you already touched the points which uh, my next question is about uh, 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 and i would i would ask uh, Evgeny the, my next question uh, you you touched about uh, the uh, preparation from the government in Georgia, what is the state little bit. But my question to Evgeny is that uh, from Microsoft I, how do you see that are the governments uh, uh, at the moment they are ready, which stages they are on uh, to go on to replace some of these civil service functions with, with AI? Because the digitalization is everywhere. They talk, everybody talk about that. But uh, what is the realistic uh, picture in, from, from your point of view? Oh, thank you. A lot of scenarios. Uh, thank you, Peter. By the way, just to clarify, I'm not against the development of technology. I, I was just saying that we need to mind about the consequences. That uh, before doing something, we just need to have a plan, and it's for sure uh, uh, education is a big part of it. And for sure, it's uh, I'm sure that it will have greater impact for economy if bus drivers will become an IT specialists or. Uh, will let's say generate more GDP in other uh, let's say um, jobs which are more proficient. So um, regarding your question, um, I see a lot of realistic scenarios, and I can just describe a few of them. Even taking an example of Georgia, I had a, a request from one of the. Uh, ministries, uh, for example, that uh, they are interested in uh, dig digitalization of the process of uh, applying to some uh, funding for the uh, individual entrepreneurs, farmers, etc. So there are some programs, economic programs in the country which allow to apply these uh, small entrepreneurs uh, for the funding, for example, like, I don't know, five, 10,000 euro for specific uh, areas, for example, to grow, I don't know, grapes or something like this. And uh, for them, it's very hard uh, to farmers, you know, uh, to use uh, 
computers and uh, to find the right, uh, um, I don't know, uh, uh, the right uh, thing to apply uh, to, to confirm that they are applying for this program to match all the requirements to understand if this right or not for them. So, and we were discussing that actually it's very easily to uh, improve the process with a, uh, with a chatbot. For example, in the phone, he can just, uh, I don't know, ask simple questions and get, and get simple, simple answers, what program he needs to apply. Instead of reading tons of, you know, um, official documents uh, or legislation acts. So this is, uh, let's say, um, which came first on my mind. Also, we see a lot of implementations around the world, uh, like for example, where AI doing great job in uh, improving economy statement uh, by detecting fraud, for example, in taxes. So uh, there are a lot of solutions and we have great partner and solutions, uh, which uh, without increasing the taxes, giving additional incomes to the governments just because AI detecting on early stage the fraud, sending signals to the tax authorities that uh, something is going wrong and the uh, inspector might uh, act very quickly. For example, uh, I had official letter confirming that uh, from Belgium tax that by using one of the solutions of our partners, yearly they save uh, more than 1 billion euro just uh, by using this uh, uh, this solution actually i propose it also to in in belarus in georgia so and i think it's uh, let's say can be implemented easily in nearest future in, in in such countries healthcare great example like uh, we have a lot of solutions which allows to forecast the uh, let's say what we can expect, uh, for example, from COVID perspective, uh, we had solutions in hospitals which uh, uh, showed forecasts uh, to the management, uh, how many beds uh, or medicine or doctors uh, they will have if certain amount of uh, uh, disease will increase in a week, uh, for example, for 10% or 12% or 20%, what they should do in order to be on a safe side, in order to have enough capacity. And it was widely, broadly using uh, around the world. So uh, I can, you know, uh, give more examples, um, just want to give some floor to the colleagues as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eugenis. It's very interesting. We are also getting a lot of questions. So I will also try to cover some of the questions uh, while, while I'm asking my, my pretty fine questions also. So we have one uh, question uh, on, on our social media, and I would like to direct this to Ole, uh, if you can answer. And the question is, how can artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques help in improving e-governance? Yeah, for sure. I, I, can, I can try to answer that. So. Um, I think like one of the biggest biggest benefit would be to uh, allow us to, pre for example, like really really simple uh, simple thing is uh, to 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 predict which what 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 is like I would say demand on the for learning right. So in case I'm student, maybe I want to understand. Um, how what what i should learn right so for example some sort of automated like recommendation engine for 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 students it's also will help government i guess to 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 like increase i would say government specialist specialist size for example uh this is could be one of the use cases like another another use case um uh could be for example uh prediction uh, uh prediction what um 
uh, yeah so so this is this is this was one of the I, I would say one of the ones which I had one on, in my mind uh, yeah okay thank you um, thank you Ole. and uh, I think uh, I would like to ask the next question to Andrea about uh, your engagements with the different governments uh, when you uh, propose the solutions what are some of the areas where you see that it's more potential to go on artificial intelligence and replace the government services so what one of well, some of the easiest ones which government can take as a first step where less complexities are involved if you can just tell us a little bit about that then it would be great okay thank you um, i think that um, it's problem for all uh, government department where I worked. It's uh, maybe uh, before IPAM, I was in uh, War Gaming. Yeah, it's a, a game company, World of Tanks. It's a big product, yeah. I met with, uh, with, with many uh, government people who asked us, uh, can you help us uh, with uh, informational technologies, AI, and the new opportunity uh, for uh, government department using new software with AI, with game, with gaming, with other product, yeah, from IT company, and um, in all place I saw. There are many problems with education, our uh, uh, government people, yeah, who uh, didn't, uh, didn't know about uh, maybe all of terms from IT. Because uh, mm, I, I send uh, a main message to every uh, people from government, please, uh, Every day uh, we meet, we will, we we uh, mm, we have to meet with a specialist from IT company and have more and more information about new technologies. It's problem in the all countries where I uh, where I worked, yeah. And um, my first uh, meeting with Arkady was in the plane when we. Uh, we went to um, one country and we had a small talk and then Arkady showed me telescope. It's our main product for uh, working with our uh, employee, yeah? I showed one slide from this uh, presentation. It's, a, I, I'm a, in my opinion, it's a, the best product for uh, working with uh, employees, with people maybe in one company or in the region or uh, all country, big country, small country and that. It's uh, give us an opportunity um, make maybe make special data lake for most information about all people and analyze all uh, their activities and give us um, more and more information about people who uh, make a decision. Uh, my last uh, me meeting with Ministry of Digital Transformation from uh, Tatarstan uh, showed me uh, the problem. Uh, he, uh, he didn't understand that uh, AI can help him uh, make a new strategy working with people. Yeah. And I wait months and months when uh, these people make a decision, when these people help us uh, build a new, uh, maybe a new social group, new social capital. Yeah. And I uh, uh, solved this problem uh, every my meeting with government people. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. 
And my next question is to, to Peter about the legal framework around artificial intelligence. Uh, as, as you are from some, some Sweden and then you are also aware of the, uh, the GDPR and all the legal rules in, in the European country. So when you compare those into Eurasia, uh, how, what are your thoughts about how ready Eurasian uh, countries uh, with regards to legal uh, regulatory framework in the AI, implementing AI? Yeah, so I think there are, are two answers. I think that it's not very much uh, existing. I mean, there, there is, of course, some, but it needs to be interpreted into AI-specific uh, regulation. <clears throat> uh, however, because of, again, speaking from Georgia's uh, point of view, uh, because of this approximation to the EU and where Georgia has become a, a member of the Council of Europe, um, uh, they are now uh, bound to to develop uh, all these uh, protection mecha mechanisms and, and and the setup. So it's not anymore a question of if, but uh, when and how. But I, I think with all the support that they're that they're getting in these kind of areas uh, with administration, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I I don't feel so worried uh, about this. I, I think it will be okay. Um, I th the most important thing, I think, in terms of, uh, of legislation and therefore the development of solutions afterwards will be, I was just writing it in the, in the, in the chat there, but I, I, the, the number one uh, task to deal with uh, will be a certification process of, uh, of uh, and this is very important, for, at least from my point of view, uh, certification uh, of the solutions that AI is used in. Because once, if you start certifying, you know, code or algorithms or, or you know, technical uh, uh, solutions, then you're, you're very quickly uh, getting into that area where Yevgeny and I had a, a discussion that you're, you're actually aiming to not create the most efficient uh, technology in order to protect something. You know? And I, I think that's very dangerous. So the certification and the protection must be on the, on the level of the of the solution or you know the product that you're uh, that you're using this technology for i think that's a very important uh, distinction uh, thank you very much so i have another question uh, here and i would like to uh, uh, direct this to evgeny uh, so the question is speaking about the shared economy concept what is the role of a state in this model and which technical solutions can help to form an ecosystem uh, for shared economic development? Actually, this uh, shared economy trend is uh, huge and uh, it covers, I don't know, uh, so many aspects of our lives. So it's really hard now to uh, narrow down to, to one specific topic or to answer the question, uh, what is the right um, let's say, uh, strategy um, of the government uh, should be regarding this uh, uh, broad, uh, broad topic. I should say that uh, for sure, why it is so popular? Because shared economy gives uh, efficiency from uh, economy perspective, right? If you're sharing costs, for some, I don't know, uh, development of the products, services. Uh, if you uh, reduce costs for citizens, uh, for example, for uh, um, some of the uh, services which provided by the government, uh, then it is um, improving uh, overall, let's say GDP growth and uh, overall uh, access to the services, etc., and uh, I think that uh, uh, what already Peter said, uh, it's important not to, uh, you know, stuck uh, 
in uh, current, let's say, legislation forms or terms and uh, be agile in order to implement those new, uh, let's say, uh, features and uh, new trends uh, quickly, quickly enough to win the global competition. And uh, I should say that uh, Georgia is uh, pretty much flexible, like the latest example I heard from JITA, uh, they implemented uh, some tax reduction, etc., in order to, you know, to motivate innovation. And uh, we also in Microsoft, we support uh, governments in all these uh, activities. Uh, we have our um, strategic engagement frameworks where we even co-invest together with governments in specific areas in order to help them uh, to achieve uh, better results, to achieve more in a, let's say, short and term and midterm. So I think that uh, government sh sh just need to be a regulator, not trying to implement business models, et cetera, et cetera. So government is a not right authority to do that. And we know it very well in Belarus, uh, right, Andre? So, <laughs> so it's, it's not a government, you know, uh, business to do business. Just step aside and let entrepreneurs to do that. So, uh, and as I said, you need to be just flexible. The legislation should allow innovation. And that's it. Uh, thank you, Evgeny. Uh, our next question is, uh, I would like to uh, uh, put this forward to uh, Ole. Uh, do you have, uh, expertise in using AI in job seeker and job board matching system. Uh, what can you recommend uh, concerning the use of uh, AI instead of using conventional matching algorithm? Yeah, so, so we are living in the world when everything is changing. And I would say like conventional algorithm will not work in all the cases, it will work in general cases. And because like, for example, engineer like right now and engineer like 20 years ago are completely different people. Um, so in case we will just use conventional algorithm, it will work for a couple of years probably, but later on we will have to change it. With AI, we can make a sort of self-learning AI, self-refined AI, which will, um, I would say refine its knowledge and provide, I would say, better capability. Uh, I don't want to say that uh, classic conventional matching algorithm are not, used, not, uh, not useful. They are useful. However, um, I think it's better to uh, make something which will be able to self-learn so we don't have to create another wheel every time, right? So, and uh, a very, very simple example, I guess everyone was facing that. So uh, like in case you'll take LinkedIn, right? The biggest network where we can find the jobs. So in many cases, like uh, we all receiving like completely irrelevant, uh, you know, recommendations for jobs. It's just because like uh, in many cases, people who are uh, looking for some sort of candidates, they are using like classical matching algorithm. And in many cases, the, the job doesn't fit you or you're overqualified or you're underqualified. So with AI, we can actually solve this thing. And also we can pre predict the demand for particular, you know, uh, I would say skill set in the future. Yeah. Hope it helps. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oleg. Yeah, uh, my, my next question is uh, to Peter uh, on um, to what extent does legislation in the field of artificial intelligence overlap today with similar regulations in the United States and the European Union? Yeah, you're, you're nailing me on legislation today, I, I, uh, I realize. Uh, no, as I said uh, before, I mean, the uh, US regulation and European regulation are sort of based on the same uh, value chain. So, you know, if we if we just uh, compare maybe the, both of those together against uh, what's happening in Georgia, it's uh, 
it's uh, I think it's a blessing in disguise for Georgia to to have made this uh, uh, approach uh, to the EU. I'm not convinced that it would be a good idea for for Georgia to become a part of EU, uh, but that's another topic, I guess. But I think that uh, uh, this uh, approach, man, uh, if they handle it correctly, they can they can gain a lot of of uh, time and effort that they will basically get for free and not having to reinvent the the, the wheel. So. That's why I said before I, I was not so worried because this process is now already sort of signed off. And if you follow the whole business uh, spectrum uh, and the, the whole spectrum of, of, uh, of any legislation, you see that uh, uh, one by one, all areas are uh, getting approached, you know, not without... Uh, uh, protests and, and uh, uh, people not being happy at some, but you know this is uh, this is normal, I guess. So, I think for uh, for everything that is this is, uh, GDPR and then uh, you know other uh, other areas, uh, you know, including all these things that you already know, but you know what what with the cameras that can uh, can find your uh, your identity or what about some national language processing that might uh, you know interfere in in your uh, privacy sphere or even give uh, uh, undue uh, advantages uh, to different directions or even you know what we what you have gene touched upon you know where where does the uh, government uh, influence uh, stop and the private companies uh, uh, take over you know there there will always be uh, things that that need to be worked through during the during this process but in general i think that uh, you know medium term uh, if we would interpret that as maybe especially in in uh, new technologies but so maybe i would say Three to five years from now, I think that at least in Georgia, you will see a quiet, uh, uh, a rigid and uh, well-developed uh, um, AI regulation uh, based on, on sound like this. This is, this is what I think. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, my next question is to Andrea, and uh, because uh, you work for IPM, which is a global company. So in that perspective, can any of the Eurasian elaborations be applied outside Eurasia? Uh, you are, uh, please unmute yourself. You are on mute at the moment. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um... As for Russia, it's a region where I worked very small because uh, the uh, main directly uh, was in Belarus. Today, I'm uh, Ark, Ark um, uh, asked me uh, begin my working to Russia, and I think that's we say we we had. Uh, um, we have uh, some problem uh, with Russia, IPAM and in Russia, because today we haven't um, maybe uh, sources for new employee. Today, uh, IPAM uh, uh, has uh, difficulties for uh, hiring new new employees, yes. And uh, when um, I asked my colleagues uh, in the Palm, it's uh, GDO or Chief of uh, Business Development, uh, he answered me. He answered me that uh, we uh, we don't want uh, working with government people in Russia. Yeah, and. Um, Today I don't ask, don't answer you about some interesting moment uh, cooperation with IPAM and Russia government. Maybe three or four cases in this working, it's uh, as trouble and main, uh, many problem for IPAM. Uh, maybe 
year ago we uh, has ban with biggest maybe uh, company Normical. Uh, it, it's problem in compliance maybe some computers is our, from our officers we send to a governmental organization without money at more than uh, three or four years we have troubles this uh, case yes okay thank you very much uh, i think we have uh, more questions but due to the time uh, apart I, I just want to ask one last question to all of you and then please answer in in one minute uh, as an expert what is your advice one advice if you want to give to the government uh, uh, decision makers at the moment in this field so i will start with uh, Evgeny. what would be your advice to the governments uh, at the moment we have some uh, government officials from tajikistan from kyrgyzstan they are listening to this what would be your advice in, in this field can i please uh, repeat the first uh, the, the beginning of the question uh, so my, my question is, uh, as an expert, what would be your advice to the government if you want to give one advice to the government about uh, implementing AI to replace ah. some of the uh, uh, civil services? What would be your uh, one advice? Uh, I think it's, it's very simple. So uh, if it is make sense uh, from efficiency perspective, and for example, if you can uh, replace uh, um, man labor with uh, technology and it give and it and, and it can give more free time or resources for other uh, let's say uh, tasks uh, we should do it because uh, as i said global competition is growing and uh, there is a risk that uh, you will be far away from the competitors if you will be very slow uh, so it's also, you can see the uh, results of this race in commercial world, right? So if companies is pretty much flexible and uh, implement innovation and uh, it has ongoing learning for the employees, as Andre said, um, it's grow and, and uh, it's showing that it is efficient way to develop. I think the same we can apply for governments and it makes sense even to implement, you know, uh, unconditional basic income, very, let's say, popular topic. Uh, we know that there even were some pilots in Switzerland where uh, citizens were just getting money uh, without having any job. And uh, it was pretty, pretty, pretty big, but economy was still efficient. So I don't know, we can give people opportunity to create something, uh, to be innovative in other spheres, to invent something, to, you know, do arts and uh, different, I don't know, entertainment. I think that it is really uh, right and uh, proven track, you know, to follow the most successful cases, companies in the world and just replicate, just implement uh, fast enough to be competitive. Otherwise, you. you will lose. That's it. Thank you very much, Evgeny. Uh, the same question to Andrea. Uh, if uh, you can give one advice to the government uh, for uh, using AI in the, in the government services. Mm. Uh, I think it's get the knowledge about new technologies and use the potential of IT companies because all government people don't know about uh, IT company near there. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter, the, the same question to you also. What, what are your, your advice to the government officials who are listening today? In this yeah, I think for I think it's very very simple. I follow on to what Andrea said. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, and as an example, we uh, <clears throat> at Neron we have we have sort of taken it upon ourselves to try to kickstart the strategy, national strategy building for AI. Because of course, it's, uh, if we can get in early, we can have more uh, input into the into the process. So it will kickstart actually on the 
On the 22nd of April, we're organizing a very high profile conference with stakeholders from both industry and the, and the public sector uh, to, to start discussing this. And I think what Andre says is completely correct. You know, uh, government needs to make sure that they inform themselves about the about the possibilities because once they have it starts rolling right and then then it works but uh, until until you pass uh, uh, that hurdle it's just very difficult because uh, as i said in the very beginning uh, you know uh, reluctance to change is a very uh, human sort of trait so you know you're afraid of change if you don't know what uh, what it encompasses so i i that my my suggestion would be to join our uh, conference on the on the 22nd of april thank you very much peter uh, ole you want to add anything here yeah I, I i will be really quickly here i want to add just two things so i want to extend on what Evgeny said so uh, ai and ml should uh automate things However, there is like a thin line because between automation and controlling life of the citizens, so government should use AI and ML, but, sh but should use it responsibly. So it's like helping us, helping their citizen, helping um, like doing things faster, automating other things, but not controlling the things because AI and ML in the end is just doing the prediction and it's, it's never like 100 accurate. And the second thing is like, government should responsibly uh, work with the data of the citizens uh, because this data can be used like for good things and for bad things and government should be like this guard who is like making sure the data about the citizen is used in the right way and not to harm him or her yeah thank you and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ole. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, Evgeny, and Peter for a very, very nice uh, discussion and then sharing your thoughts. I would like to also thank the strategist and especially Anatoly and uh, Prasco uh, on uh, organizing uh, the, the panel and all the cooperation and uh, all the discussion we have recorded and this will be available uh, on uh, University of Central Asia's YouTube channel uh, in, in a couple of days. Uh, thank you very much all the participants for your engagement and listening on uh, Zoom and also on social media. Thank you very much and have a very nice day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.